The argument from succession is an argument for historicity. It goes, What characteristically happens on the death of a charismatic leader is that a struggle ensues between parties who wish to succeed them. This is exactly what happened following the death of Jesus. Various parties, including James the Just, who may have been Jesus' brother, another group variously referred to as the Pillars, and the Pauline group vied for succession, with the Pauline group ultimately winning. The argument is based on historical parallels, and there are many, both within and out with religious communities. These include Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. The most often cited religious one is the struggle for the leadership of Islam that followed the death of Muhammad in 632 AD. Another is the Mormon schism that followed the death of Joseph Smith. There are of course several other causes of schism, such as intractable theological disagreements or struggles between rival centres of power. Examples of these within Christianity include the schism between Eastern and Western churches, between Catholicism and Protestantism, between conformist and non-conformist Protestantism, and how could I pass up the opportunity of mentioning the arguments in the Anglican Church involving establishmentarianism, disestablishmentarianism and anti-disestablishmentarianism. Anyway, as I stated it at the outset, the argument from succession carries a flaw which is so serious as to render it utterly useless unless the flaw can be worked around. That flaw is circularity. To say that a schism commonly follows the death of a charismatic leader, that we know there was a schism in the early church and therefore there must have been the death of a charismatic leader before it, begs the question. Specifically, we have assumed the death of a charismatic leader in our initial approach to the question of schism. We have not looked at any other causes of schism. What we know is that there was a schism and the fair way of dealing with this argument would be to look at how that schism compares with other schisms without any preconceptions about how it was provoked. If it turns out that schisms of these different causes have recognisably different characteristics, and that the early Christian schism looks very like those that followed the deaths of charismatic leaders, then the argument would have some merit. But if, on the other hand, we find out that there's nothing particular to link this schism in Christianity more closely to those that follow the death of charismatic leaders than to any other schisms that arise for any number of reasons, then in principle we would have been able to work around the circularity, but in practice we'd still be left with an unsalvageable argument. Now there may be general differences between these types of schisms that may allow them to be discriminated. The theological dispute schism arises because a disagreement becomes so deep as to result in rebellion. This leads to the characteristics of a tendency for only one schism to occur at a time, and that the schism is driven by the doctrinal issue rather than power play, though this may be difficult to discriminate. Of course, in practice it may not happen that way. A schism may weaken an organisation and tempt belligerents to declare themselves, giving rise to multiple competing factions. In the case of the death of a charismatic leader, the conflict is born of a power vacuum. This tends to mean power play is the driving factor rather than doctrinal differences. It also tends to mean that multiple belligerents declare themselves simultaneously. A closer look at the Islamic schism just mentioned shows just how difficult this kind of distinction can be. A few months before his death, Muhammad gave a sermon at Ghadir Qum in which he said that his cousin and the husband of his daughter Fatima, Ali ibn Abi Talib, would succeed him. However, shortly after Muhammad died, a group of Muslims met at Safika and gave the post to Abu Bakr, the father of Muhammad's favoured wife Aisha. Abu Bakr's supporters were to become what we now know as Sunnis. However, another group that became what we now call Shias retained allegiance to Ali. Abu Bakr reigned for two years and despite this short reign was highly successful militarily, extending the Muslim empire to all of Arabia and extending north to Palestine. Abu Bakr died in 624 and was succeeded by another of Muhammad's fathers-in-law, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar was an accomplished politician and strategist. He had been instrumental in the meeting which handed the leadership to Abu Bakr. Umar was highly motivated, intelligent and astute. He was not particularly popular with his peers, but was a champion of the poor and underprivileged, and had a reputation of impartial justice. 
Like Abu Bakr, he was also successful militarily and expanded the Muslim empire further. He is credited with establishing the world's first welfare state. He was assassinated in 644, 12 years after the death of Muhammad. He was stabbed and took three days to die, during which time he appointed a committee of six people to choose his successor. Umar was against appointing anyone who was a blood relative of his to be his successor. Uthman ibn Affan, a son-in-law of Muhammad, was selected to be the third caliph. He also expanded the Muslim empire and reigned until 656 when he was killed in a rebellious uprising. The rebels then had to select a new caliph, which was problematic as they were themselves divided into several rival groups. Three candidates emerged. Ali ibn Abi Talib was approached first but declined the offer. Other potential candidates were also approached and also declined. Exasperated, the rebels threatened drastic action if Medina's inhabitants did not select a caliph within one day. The Muslims gathered on June 18, 656 to appoint a caliph and again approached Ali, who again was reluctant but gave in under pressure, becoming the fourth caliph at the age of 54, some 24 years after he was first named by Muhammad as his successor. The feuding which led to the rebellion that killed Uthman never really resolved and escalated into a civil war within the first year of Ali's reign. With those who believed Uthman to have been a virtuous caliph who had been unjustifiably killed on one side and those who followed Ali believing Uthman to have been a corrupt caliph who was legitimately killed on the other. Ali was himself assassinated in 661 and was succeeded by his son Hassan but Hassan had a militarily more powerful rival General Mu'awiyah, who also declared himself caliph. Hassan was forced to capitulate political power to Mu'awiyah, and this sealed the division between Sunnis, who followed Mu'awiyah and his successors as their religious leaders on the one hand, and the Shias, who followed Ali, Hassan and their descendants on the other. So ask yourself, is it really possible to discern a pattern in this early history of the Islamic schism that suggests it was characteristic of the kind of schism that follows the death of a charismatic leader? Or does it simply reflect the unpredictable ebb and flow of history? I would say the latter. And the early history of Islam is far better documented than the early history of Christianity. That being so, what chance is there that we will be able to make a reliable judgment on what the likely origin of the early Christian schism was? I would say that the question is clearly a hopeless one. That means that the argument from succession is killed off by circularity, and even though this can be worked round in principle, in practice the argument cannot be resuscitated. I therefore consider it to be a useless argument, favouring neither historicity nor mythicism. <laughs>